So thank you all for joining us today. My name is Sarah Brown with the Arizona Daily Star, and we are joined by a guest that we all desperately need to talk to. So we're excited to have her with us here today. We have Christy Street with us today, who's joining us from Next Trio. Welcome, Christy. It's so nice to have you with us today. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yes. So, um, you know, just to give a little preview, um, Christy, her business, uh, she's a managing partner at Next Trio, and although they focus mostly for businesses, I've heard Christy speak because sometimes this kind of conversation can go like way above us everyday person's head. And so although she focuses um, on businesses, she made it so simple to understand some of these tips about, you know, keeping ourselves secure, our identity, our devices. Um, so we just had to have her to come talk about this subject because we all need it. So if you want to kind of introduce yourself a little further, Christy, and I, but I do want to just tell everybody, as always, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'll be looking out for those and I'll ask Christy as they come up or feel free to raise your virtual hand as well if you guys have some specific questions. So go ahead and introduce yourself a little further. Sure, thanks, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I always feel like I should do two things when I start a conversation about uh, IT security. One is to wish that we could do this as a cocktail hour because I feel like um, this really is one of those topics where uh, it, it just goes down better with a little medicine. Um, and so my, my goal for today, and we'll see if we hit this goal, is to make you aware. And sometimes awareness creates a little sense of, um, of concern or makes us cringe and, and tense up. Uh, but I also want to, to assure you that hopefully we'll provide some solutions and some simple steps that really will loosen that tension and quite frankly, make you just a little bit safer in a world that um, where where it's the goal is to, to not be the last gazelle in the herd out on the plains. We want to be a little bit faster and a, um, a little bit ahead of the curve. And that's pretty easy to accomplish. So, so that's number one. Number two is I really am committed to not using technical jargon and techno babble. Now, there are some things I have to describe just because I like to use the real um, uh, lexicon, but I, I just, I'm, I am you. Um, I, I, I happen to be the CEO of a technology company, but I got that job because not, well, really not because I love IT per se, but because I love a guy that loves IT. And so um, I like to think that if he was um, a blacksmith, I'd be selling wrought iron fences. Uh, and, he, and so I just, you know, what, for whatever credibility that buys me and a commitment to keeping this to uh, a fun conversation where we can, um, you know, talk about things. And, and P.S., there's a lot that is not known. Um, so I won't try to answer every question, but I can point you in some general directions. So, so kudos to you all for showing up without the promise of cocktails. And um, let's, uh, let's get started with uh, a couple of tips and tricks. So, so first of all, I, it's, it is fitting that a business focused IT company talks about um, uh, personal IT and personal technology security. And that's because the line between business and personal has really blurred, right? I mean, even pre COVID, we used our consumer devices at our office, we used our office devices in our home, we um, you know, we, we definitely have a uh, mentality that uh, some, you, you fall in one camp or another, which is connected is good or connected is bad, but you can't really argue with the fact that connected opportunities are everywhere and there really isn't a lot of um, distinction between home and office like there used to be. And now fast forward to the um, I would love to say post-COVID, but it's we're still in the middle of COVID uh, world where that's even more complicated as we have remote workers and and um, and folks doing a lot of uh, gig work or or side jobs or having um, hobbies that turn into quote unquote businesses, um, and so I will 
I'm just going to talk about technology. There will be pieces of this that really apply better, um, you know, at scale with um, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, employees or customers, et cetera. But really and truly, a lot of this is directed to just good hygiene, just good practices for all of us, whether we're at home with one dog or in the office with 50 other people. So um, hopefully we will uh, answer a bunch of questions in between. So um, I think there's there's probably not a lot of question that that there's vulnerability, right? And maybe we could just even do a quick show of hands. You know, do, do, is it your perception that from a technology standpoint, things have gotten um, better or worse? And I'll, I'll just say, raise your hand if you think it's a little scarier today than it was two years ago. Okay, you would be in the right, right? The data would show that that's actually true. Um, and, and as a side note, um, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit of a stacked deck for those of us who uh, just want to go about our day and, and do business with the, the, the shops and stores that we want to patronize, um, as well as who just want to earn a living or or send information out through social media to our, our families and, and extended families. The stacked deck comes in the you know, where it used to be the old um, uh, metaphor that uh, the hacker, if, if you needed help with something, ask a 12-year-old or ask a nine-year-old. The hacker was a kid bored in his parents' basement. That's no longer the case. I mean, I, uh, they're still out there, I suppose, but really and truly that we're talking about nation states and this being a, an actual offensive um, business model for countries that want to just disrupt. Uh, their, their main goal is to be disruptive. And so we are seeing um, an increase and a, um, an opportunistic increase in things like ransomware, where somebody um, uh, steals your data and, and uh, asks you to give them money to be able to um, ransom back the data so that you could uh, hopefully get your data back. We're seeing an increase in scareware, which is um, folks, uh, you know, having pop-ups on their computers or um, phone calls, uh, trying to solicit information kind of in the, a con man uh, way to, to gain access to privilege information. We're seeing identity theft and we're seeing um, uh, an increase in um, fraudulent activity uh, on, on all fronts. And so, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. The question is, you know, what, what should we be on the lookout for and how can we, um, you know, really take some basic steps in each of these categories. Now, um, I can talk about each of these or I can do a PowerPoint because at my house we do PowerPoints and um, we do them for what's for dinner because I like to um, to actually write things down. And I, I and so if you don't mind, I'll, I will share my screen and we'll, we'll talk through a couple of these, but I you have to promise me if I do the PowerPoint um, I, that you won't go to sleep and that you will ask questions. And um, I, I in, uh, encourage you to jump in in the middle and I know Sarah is watching the chat box so um, if, do, if you those rules... catch, do you want me to catch up with some of the questions that are in there before we yeah start? go ahead and do that while I while I load up the PowerPoint that sounds good okay um, so let's see starting out uh, Thomas was asking do you recommend paying hackers when they take control of your computer oh that's a great question um, so no I don't. And, and in fact, if you're not careful, depending on who the hackers end up actually being, which a lot of times we as the average person on the street don't know who's behind the hacking, um, you could actually end up violating um, federal law by negotiating with terrorists back to that kind of nation state um, uh, uh, offensive move. Uh, I will tell you that um, that we have seen a number of folks who had to involve law enforcement, FBI, and they flat out said, not only do we not recommend it, you're not allowed to. Um, so, so my first rule is don't put yourself in a position where you have to negotiate with 
data terrorists. Um, it, this is hap this happens to be one of my pet peeves, and and it is um, something that is unnecessary to put yourself in a position where your only choice is to beg somebody through the use of money or charm to give you back something. Um, unlike an actual hostage situation with data, if you have a, a backup in order to get your data back, um, you could actually just say, keep the hostage, right? That's not the case in, in most of our negotiations when people are the hostage. Um, but in this case, there, once the data is out in the world, there's no way to unring the bell. So the, the protection of your data has, has left, whether you pay the, the ransom and get your encryption key to unlock your files uh, or not. And half the time, they don't do it. I mean, there's that old saying, there's no honor among thieves, right? Um, and so, so really and truly, your best choice is to say, cool, you stole my stuff, I will start working on protecting my credit and, you know, changing my name or whatever we need to do to fix the identity crisis, which exists whether you pay the ransom or not. I don't recommend that you pay, pay the ransom. I recommend you have a great backup. So hopefully that explains a, a little bit of my philosophy. Um, the time to think about that is while you're not under ransom. So really and truly having um, a good copy of your files off of your computer someplace safe not attached to your computer and this is this is one of those things where sometimes um, I'll, I'll run into a client who has uh, a little drive hanging off of their computer and that drive is their backup but it's still plugged into their computer it's all one computer at that point you really need to have a backup that's detached and separate you can plug it in while you're backing up and then you need to pull it away and leave it off to the side because if if someone gains access unauthorized to your computer, they can go through the hard drive in that computer and they can go to the hard drive attached to the computer um, through USB or, or however else is there. It is also common, by the way, that folks confuse backup and archive. Um, and I will just tell you that it's if you use a cloud-based backup, and sometimes a lot of us rely on iCloud, for, for example, for storage of our photos that might be on our iPhone, um, it's, it's very common to go occasionally and just grab a copy of what's in the cloud and put it someplace else. Because a lot of times, and in fact, there are, there are data for businesses that show that sometimes the intruder has been there for days, weeks, or months. Um, on average, before they surface and make themselves known, an intruder at a business, um, in, inside of a business network and inside of a business data, can be there for 250 days before the person knows. Now, if you think about it, that means your 249 days of backup before the day they surface may include the code or the virus or whatever allowed that bad guy to get in. So, so pulling off an archive periodically um, and, and again, taking it out of the cloud so that you're not consistently backing up the bad guy with your cloud data is also another strategy there. So is this something that, you know, you can go to a local computer store and you buy this backup, you know, we're, we're talking about like, let, you know, obviously our businesses have different things that they offer, but for just as yeah. an individual, can I go to Best Buy? Can I go you to sure CWS and, and buy something and tell them what I need it for and be able to come home and actually back up what I need to? Absolutely. And, and I talked about two different types of backup, one being kind of a local USB a drive. You, you stick it into the USB slot of your computer or your laptop, and that hard drive is external, and you can back up stuff. And that's that's for sale for about 50 bucks from Amazon or Best Buy. Um, and you can figure out how to just copy files. You don't need to have a special um, set of skills or knowledge. And then some of my uh, favorite options for cloud-based backup are things like Carbonite, and, and you hear ads for them on the radio or see, see ads online for them. Uh, those services are very inexpensive. They can be, you know, as cheap as $10 a year. Um, and so you can create that cloud-based backup, uh, have all your files out in the internet, 
uh, on Carbonite's website. You can even archive from Carbon Carbonite. Um, you can create a hybrid of the two, have some on your local drive so you can get to them quickly, put your archive up in Carbonite and that's your cold storage where you save things that that's really the Armageddon case. Um, you, can, you can construct all of that yourself for very inexpensive and, um, and it's worth it. Um, it's worth it to, to have that extra protection because it gives you choices if the nasties. And, and by the way, it's not just bad guys. It's also just, you know, typical hardware failure. You dropped your coffee on your laptop. It fried the hard drive. It's the same. It, it might as well be ransomed. You're, you're, you're still not going to get your data. So it's a good protection. It uh, serves multiple purposes. Well, something so scary that makes it manageable. It's like, hey, I can go on Amazon. I can buy this external hard drive and figure it out. And then when the hackers, you know, when it does happen, all right, that's okay. I'm taken care of. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, well, go other... on ahead with the oh, PowerPoint. Okay. I mean, yeah, questions, sure. are, questions are coming in, but I okay. kind of have a feeling a lot of it's going to get covered in this. So then I will sure. try to kind of filter out the rest of those uh, no that problem. covered. So I, I covered the four main areas we're gonna talk about really in my introduction here, which is, you know, uh, it's what's personal is business and vice versa. Um, we're talking about computers. So it's very common to think about your laptop or your desktop. And I saw there were a couple comments about Macs and um, uh, versus uh, PC, Windows PCs um, and Chromebook. Um, those are really the three choices in the world today. Um, and I can talk a little bit about, you know, the, the differences there as far as strategy. But, but when you think about protection, when you think about fraud, when you think about risk, really and truly, um, it, all of them have some element of fraud, risk, um, or uh, uh, intrusion. And so you really do need to have some degree and while the tools or the strategy might vary slightly between the different type of operating system you're using, um, no one, one, no one operating system, no, not Google, not Apple, although they will claim in some of their advertising, nobody is perfect, um, and and they are all they all require a little bit of strategy and thought. Um, and in addition to that, we we're not just talking about um, you know phones and computers. We're also talking about um, people calling you up and asking you for information, um, people texting you, and and you falling for for the some of the tricks. So really, we have to do that. We also have to don't forget this is this is old school, but it's alive and well, let me tell you the physical and paper based security. I mean, think about the last time you tried to upgrade one of your phones or desktops. Where did that device go? Is it still sitting in your drawer? Is it, um, you know, did you recycle it? Did you wipe the data off of it before you recycled? So we're talking about um, physical and paper-based uh, information as well. And then, as I said, just basically people asking you um, for information. It happens all the time. Um, my general rule of uh, is slow down. I know I talk fast, but if it feels weird, slow the conversation, slow, slow your mouse click, um, and really do, do a little extra thinking, do a little extra, wait a minute, ask a friend, um, you know, call, call up Best Buy. I, I highly recommend them for the average con consumer. Um, you know, they, they love to talk on the phone. They love when you bring your devices in, they are great at training and have, um, uh, while, while they're, they're not necessarily designed to replace an IT department for a business, they're really helpful for almost like a, um, uh, an urgent care for computers. So um, for, the, for the average consumer. So I highly recommend, you know, slowing your role and unplugging from the internet and taking something down if you have any questions and do what we call kind of like a, a mole check, um, which is, oops, sorry, can't make this be quiet. Um, a mole check that you would do if you had a friend who was a dermatologist. Hey, can you take a look at this? Is this a thing? We do that all the time with, with our clients, and I know that Best Buy does that as well. Um, I will tell you that sometimes you have to use technology to fight technology. Um, so don't skip the easy things like antivirus software, anti-malware software. Uh, I like a, a couple of ones that are um, available widely. We get 
we get recommendations all the time for AVG, for antivirus software. Uh, we get malware bytes for malware. We like Webroot for, for antivirus. They all are a little bit back and forth, some days one's good, some days another. A lot of time, um, a lot of times if you buy a new computer from Dell or HP, it'll come preloaded with Norton um, and or Symantec and, and those are fine. Uh, they, they tend to have more ads um, and ads are just annoying, which is a different type of malware, but they're also effective and they're better than nothing. Um, built into some of the uh, operating systems, and you'll see ads for this about Chrome and Apple, and now um, with Windows, is some basic um, uh, technology to, to prevent viruses and to prevent intrusion. You'll see Windows Defender, for example. Um, go look, if, if you have Windows 10, go look and see what the security settings are and, um, and make sure that, I mean, they've really made it accessible for us. They've made nice green check boxes that say you're protected or big red stop signs that say something's wrong. Um, so, so don't, don't hesitate to go into that um, window system and, and just type in the word security or secure and a whole bunch of, of buttons will come up. You really can't mess it up. Um, and it'll give you some idea of what you already own that's free. Um, I will also say as we, as we really continue into you know, the 2022, I'm shocked that we're still the number one way that folks get into anybody's computer is through email phishing attempts. And that's phishing with a PH, which is basically um, sending an, uh, a broadcasted message out to the masses and see who clicks on the links. And you've seen these, there are examples, hey, your FedEx package is on its way, but it's not really from FedEx. The, the email's not from FedEx. Hey, Wells Fargo, your password expired. Please click here to reset your password. But but Wells Fargo spelled slightly differently, and so it's not really Wells Fargo. These phishing attempts they work really well. Um, the old days of of you know sending money to the Nigerian prince, um, th those those were first round attempts. They have gotten very very savvy. Um, ask any bank, and their security team will tell you that um, sometimes the banks have a hard time recognizing the difference between their real message and their uh, phishing messages that are sent by the bad guys. So um, there's always that moment where you have the opportunity to pause before you click on something. And then there's the moment where you clicked on something and you think, oh, why did I click on that? What just happened? Um, I'm, I would train you to try to lean more into the before you click on something and you know double check uh, from your service providers uh, if something is real or not. And most service providers, by the way, so banks, um, uh, things like I have a Dropbox message here, they will publish a, um, a, a number to call if you want to check a message that you've received. They will in encourage you to, to not ever reset your password or enter personal information online. To, the, they'll ask you to call and verify. Um, and so, so you have the opportunity to skip the, the convenience of clicking a link. And I highly recommend that you do that. Same on cell phones. So that's called smishing, as in SMS, which is a uh, short message standard for texting, SMS. Um, and plus phishing equals smishing. And during COVID, we saw a lot of people opportunistically um, taking advantage of texting um, information to people. So this is everything, particularly when Apple, um, when you're using an iPhone and your Apple ID is required, some people get confused. Apple will never text you a message asking you to change your, your Apple ID. Um, really no one should send you, um, no one unexpected, a number you don't expect, should send you a link to click on. Um, and if they do, you should skip over the clicking step and go straight to their website to do that. Um, and, you know, there are, in addition to that, I think you've probably, if you're like me, you've seen on social media people saying, I've been hacked, don't friend me, don't unfriend me. Um, uh, I, you know, this is not me. I didn't send that. That's not right. 
there's a plethora of security settings now in every social media platform from Twitter to Instagram to Facebook um, and Snapchat even. And most folks don't realize, and this is my, my social media tip of the day, if you looked at the settings and on your web-based browser on your computer, they might be slightly different than the settings on your mobile phone for that same Instagram application. Check them both. Make sure that what you published on uh, in Instagram on your uh, laptop using the web browser, that those settings match what's on your phone. Um, and that, that they can sometimes be different. They can sometimes not translate between the two. So check both. Um, and use as, as the uh, social media moguls will tell you, please report things as bad. Rep that they really rely on crowdsourcing when people suspect something or um, they think that something is a spammer. Um, please, please click and, and report um, bad actors on social media platforms. It really does matter and it does help um, the whole community. So just to uh, clarify that, Christy, so let's say I'm on my app on Instagram or Facebook on my phone and I update my settings of, you know, security, I then need to go and log on on my PC to Facebook or Instagram and double check because if I hadn't, then if I post or this or that, I could be getting issues from one or the other, like security wise. Exactly. And, and I will take it one step further. Let me, um, so, so because the web browser is one kind of application to access Instagram, and let's say you have an iPhone, or let, actually, let's say you have an Android phone, that's a different kind of application. It's a whole, it, it looks a lot like the same thing you see on the web, but it's actually its own self-contained program designed to be installed on Android devices. And further, if you have an iPad, you will um, notice that the um, uh, Apple application is somewhat different, mm -hmm. just slightly different from the Android application. So um, we, we encourage you to look at every mobile device and every installation slightly different um, and, and make sure that those settings are in parity. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'm sorry, I'm in a borrowed office, so I, um, I'm turning off their phone. I apologize if I blew anybody's ears out. Um, so, so if you fell for, a, if you suspect you fell for a phishing scam, um, you have a couple of different um, uh, options. Log out of your email immediately um, and call the email supplier or, or go online to the email supplier to um, provider to change your password instantly, as, as soon as possible. Um, make sure when you change your password that you have used a difficult password. And we'll talk about passwords in a couple minutes. Um, make sure that you run a virus scan on the computer that you were actually just using to access that email. Um, that's really important. And if something is found, you're a, a really good antivirus program should immediately quarantine and box off any suspicious um, uh, information that you may have accidentally downloaded or invited into your computer. Um, I would, you know, always caution you not to check your email on an, on an insecure email, uh, an insecure Wi-Fi network. So this would include, unfortunately, things like uh, Starbucks or um, other coffee house places, the places where they make it very convenient and easy for folks to get on, um, but not necessarily to, to make sure that it's a secure network. So um, those are those are great places to um, to do you know reading the newspaper online, but um, but not necessarily doing your banking or checking your email. Um, so and then I at the end of the presentation I have a little website. It's called um, Have I Been Pawned, which is a, a hacker slang for has my has my email address been owned? Has it been stolen? Hacked by somebody? Is my data out there? And I'll give you that address. You can go look for yourself and see. Oh my goodness, I was I didn't know I was part of the Fitbit um, data breach, or I was part of the Dropbox data breach. And there are thousands and thousands of 
of uh, breaches and millions and millions of compromised emails. And it might be interesting and enlightening for you to enter your own uh, email address and see uh, which accounts you might want to go um, go change and update your credentials on. And uh, again, that's at the end here. If and Christy, you. just to clarify, because we got some questions about like sure. you were saying about checking your email on Wi-Fi. In those instances, is it better to rely on the data of your phone versus connecting to a wi an unsecure Wi-Fi network? If that's the way that you have already set up your email, if you're if you actually are using an email application on your phone and not just using the web browser to to go through the Wi-Fi, uh, yes, it is it, it is better to do that. Another common way um, is to create um, a, a secure uh, a tunnel back to. Um, your email provider. It's sometimes called a VPN. That's a pretty technical conversation for a different day. Um, but but most in most cases, when you use the email application on your phone, so not checking through a web browser on your phone, but using the email application, that is more secure. There is a, a, a level of encryption there. So that, that should be better. And would that extend to using like... Um... I would assume, you know, Wi-Fi at a hotel or something like that, because that's still considered unsecure to your device. Absolutely. If there, the the way you know a Wi-Fi um, uh, is unsecure is um, if if it is not something you configured on your system. It's if it's something that anybody with a code or a password can get onto, even or or even worse, if it's left open, it's it's not a secure. Just just having it be. Um, Having it have a password doesn't necessarily imply that it is a secure connection, particularly in hotels where maybe the password is your room number um, or your last name or whatever. That, that does not necessarily imply that it's secure. That just means that um, it's not free <laughs> for everybody. Um, so uh, I want to say one word about spoofing here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I do get a lot of questions from, from folks who say, I did not send an email to 50 of my friends, but they all think that I did. And now I look like the dirty person. Um, and so really and truly, I, it's, it's important for everybody to know it's pretty easy to fake an email address. So it doesn't have to come from you, uh, even though it looks like it came from you, even though it says it came from you, um, it's very easy to fake an email address. What happens and what makes this seem like it's really you is that if you've ever been in a group with a CC or an actual, your name's actually in the two line um, and somebody compromises someone else's machine, they see who goes together in that group. So if you're on a board or you're, you know, you're part of a family distribution group or whatever, um, it makes sense that they, they pick a name and oftentimes they'll pick, you know, um, uh, the first name in the list, or they'll pick a name that says I'm the president of this club or group or whatever, um, and they'll they'll fake that address. They're they're smart hackers. They're they're not dumb. They want things to to have a good chance of of um, tricking you. So they pick that that name and they send it to that group, and they'll say hey, I'm stuck on the side of the road and I need you know, six Target gift cards to be able to get <laughs> home tonight. Um, and that, that seems legitimate because I am sending it, the fake me is sending it front to a group of people that it would make sense. You, you see everybody else in that club on the two line. So how do you combat that? Um, you use the blind copy. The BCC line is your friend. Please, whenever you're sending to more than two people, please send um, in the BCC line and ask every group and club and board that you belong to, to, to do the same. Number one, it stops that horrible reply all situation. And then two, it protects you a little bit so that the, sp the spammers, hackers, whoever gets into you know, intern number seven's email and sees your name in um, in the two line or the CC line, um, it, it stops that that process and that whole spoofing that makes everybody crazy where you have to send out messages saying it wasn't me. 
Um, so I did talk about complex passwords, and I just want to spend a couple seconds here and demonstrate for you, um, and, and this is not my chart, um, this is a, a well-known chart on the web, but um, you've got to make it hard for the bad guys. You've got to get a password that is um, difficult to guess, that is not in the dictionary, um, that is involves a series of uppercase, lowercase, and uh, symbols and numbers all combined. Now, obviously, those are terrible passwords to remember. And I don't encourage you to write them on sticky notes and stick it under your keyboard, like <laughs> a lot of us do. Um, I encourage you to use a password keeper. And But I will tell you the difference. And if you look here, if you get a 13 character password with all of those four components, upper, lower, number, and symbol, um, versus just having a lowercase password. The hackers run their little programs trying to crack your password. Um, 13 characters would take them a year. 13 characters plus all those extra hard components takes them 2 million years. So Christy, a question in the chat mm -hmm. that goes so well with this. Um, Connie mentioned that she uses her computer's generated password. Mm -hmm. Is that good to do? Is that safe? Yeah, it is. I will tell you that you have the option to generate a, a eight digit no symbols password, or you have the option to, to, to generate a 13 digit, you know, with symbols password, wherever possible, because you're using the built in, not only generate it, but usually there's an option to save it. Um, so, so you don't have to remember it. You don't even have to write it down and it should be unique. So go ahead and make that as long as you and as difficult as you possibly can. Because as you can see from this chart, when you get into this green area, you give yourself a fighting chance of not having your password cracked. If you use, if you use your, your hometown, your, your dog's first name, et cetera, what you find is that um, you're back in this purple category and it's, it's probably out there in, in the database of passwords in the sky. And the very first thing that those hackers and, uh, and programmers have done is try known passwords. So, um, there, you know, there really is a password database in the sky, and it, it includes all the things you think are clever, like password, but instead of an A, it's the ad sign. No, those, th those are, that's the first thing. That's what the eight-year-olds try. So, um, so make, it, make it easy on yourself. This, if there's one takeaway from today, please just do this. This puts you six gazelles a her ahead of the last gazelle in the herd just by using a difficult password and because I realize that it's painful and I have to do this myself use a password keeper and I like um, a couple different ones LastPass it's $35 a year for the paid version but they have a, a free version um, it I don't have to remember anything about my passwords and I can have a unique one, a different one at every site that I am, um, and it fills it in for me. Um, there's other good ones out there, RoboForm, um, KeePass. There's some. There's a lot of a lot of choices. They are. Um, I get asked questions every year. Are those systems safe? What happens if somebody cracks that? They have all the keys to my kingdom. It is more likely that those folks have better security than any of us individually do, um, and that they would call you if they were hacked and ask you to change your passwords uh, versus you would never know that you were individually hacked on any site. So it is, it is a law of averages, but I would highly encourage you to consider um, making it easy on yourself to have a hard password. Last point about passwords, there is, and you will see this in the next 24 months, um, we, were, we are moving away from having um, multi-factor authentication that involves your cell phone. So back to that smishing thing, it's very easy to spoof a, or to fake a cell phone number. So if, for example, your bank today may ask you for your name, your user ID, your password, and then try to text you a code. And sometimes they have a fourth layer of, of multi-factor uh, prove that it's you. It might be a secret question that you filled out. Um, they, they're going to start saying the, the send a code to your phone is not an option anymore. So just be aware. Uh, they'll, they'll give you some other choices. 
uh, most often that's some kind of little application that's running on your pho phone that gives you a one-time code. That's different than having a text message sent to you with a code, which could be easily stolen. So just be aware that multi-factor multi -factor authentication is imperative, but some of the convenience of having it be your cell phone um, text message, those have gone away. All right, um, I talked a little bit about, you know, not using the open public Wi-Fi. Um, I, I just want to make sure that you um, realize that not only you'll see a lot of changes in the cell phone world regarding security in the next 24 months. They are all working on stopping robocalls. They are all working on um, smishing messages and they're also asking people who write applications that you download, all those apps you go to the app store and put on your phone, they're telling them, stop creating your own browser to, to redirect traffic to your website um, because it's not secure. And so you'll see those changes happening. You may be asked to update your apps on your phone because of that. Uh, I, I just, this is really quick when you're throwing away things. Um, I please, 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 please make sure that um, you have uh, wiped information off of them. And if possible, if you're working from home, don't use your home computer and your work computer. And this, this really applies to your phones as well. Um, keep your work data and your, your personal data separate on your mobile and your uh, uh, compute your computing devices. That's really difficult sometimes, especially since those lines are blurred. Um, I will tell you more and more businesses are going to uh, require you to keep those segregated. We're just playing catch up right now since we had to send everybody home kind of quickly. Um, but but it's it makes a lot of sense if you think about it. You don't want to do your business on the same computer that your 13-year-old son is playing uh, mm -hmm. Minecraft or Fortnite on for obvious reasons. Um, so get, keep, keep those walls separate. Uh, I talked a little bit about um, cloud security. And the one other thing I would just add to that is your hiring a cloud service provider, something like um, Microsoft email or Google email or, um, or a backup service, it does not absolve you of your rights um, and your obligations to protect yourself. They take care of some stuff. They're mostly designed to take care of themselves. They basically will disclaim if you ever read their user um, license agreement, they will say, you're, you're ultimately responsible for the hygiene of your own computer and the sac sacredness of your own data. So keep a copy if you really need this stuff. Uh, that's something that I think a lot of people think that by buying a cloud service provider, um, their services for $30 a year, that somehow they're on the hook to, to help with that. And they, they can't do it for $30 a year. So keep that in mind. You're, you're your only um, rescuer. And um, and then I guess the other thing I would say is with regard to account information, banks really make a distinction between someone who gained your legitimate password and someone who cracked your password or, um, or, or got into their systems using a, a not your password. The difference being that it's harder to prove who is authorized when they have the real password. Um, that is that because you have a, a rotten stepbrother or is that because um, a hacker uh, was trying to gain access? And if, it's, if, if someone captures your password um, and legitimately uses it to log in and redirect funds, it's gonna be a much harder claim with the bank to, to get that money back. Um, so keep in mind that um, protecting your machine sometimes is not even just about cracking the password, it's about privacy and keeping information, keeping other people from knowing that, you know, Susie's password is always Fluffy, her favorite dog. Because um, you may not be covered by the same uh, unauthorized uh, hacker uh, claims, in, in particularly with financial um, situations. And okay, you, yes. Um, because you touched on passwords again, uh, we had Deborah ask, um, you had mentioned LastPass as a password keeper, but are there a couple others you could mention that you recommend? 
Sure. Um, Roboform us. is one of the other ones that is, is fairly common. Um, there, there are a number of them out there. Um, LastPass happens to be my personal favorite. Um, uh, Passkey um, is another one that comes to mind. I mean, I, I would, if you just do a search for, um, for Roboform or for um, LastPass, you'll see all the competitors. They're all fairly um, uh, comparable. Um, they're all top market um, and they all operate under the, a similar business model, which is put all your unique passwords in our database you have to remember one master password. If you forget the one master password, even they can't crack into it. Um, and one of the benefits of using a, a, a software solution like that, um, and, and I use this all the time with LastPass, is it's gonna go through and kind of sanity check and say, you know, you're using the same password over here for the bank that you use for the car dealership. You might wanna change one of those or and this is, this is also another benefit, long before you'll ever hear it in the paper, LastPass could say, hey, Google just had a breach. You probably wanna go change the Google email um, password that you have stored in the vault. Um, so some of those proactive jump, get ahead of the curve things are also great benefits of having a, a, a software-based um, password keeper like LastPass or Roboform, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I, I think shredding and disposal is important. I will just tell you um, it's hard during pandemic to find access to um, shredding services. Not, most of the chambers are not doing their, you know, bring your box down and shred your stuff days anymore. Um, just keep keep that stuff um, and, and keep an eye out. I think as, as folks are getting back into the office, you will find more and more places um, will do that. I, I just want to give a shout out for my favorite um, electronics recycler here in town who will shred um, and or erase and repurpose your um, your information and that suburban miners. Um, they're, they're great. They take a lot of things um, and they have a great protocol for cleaning. Um, now, if, you, if you're building rockets or spaceships, I just want to say there really is no safe wiping for government data. Um, you, the best option for having information on a hard drive that is super secret, you know, uh, classified information is to just destroy that hard drive. And for that, you have a couple of different shredding services in town. Um, uh, you can uh, take it take it to those folks, or you could do it the old fashioned way and put on a pair of eye protection goggles and sledgehammer it out on the back patio. Um, but you have to find a place that you can take the um, the electronic waste because there are, um, you can't just throw that in the landfill. So uh, back to suburban miners, um, they often have uh, hard drive shred days there as well. So check in with them and see if their shredder is working. Um, that's the safest, best way. If you go look on eBay while I'm talking and look for used hard drive, um, you will see that that's a whole business model of people who just buy used hard drives that they found um, for free in discarded computers. Um, and it's basically like a grab bag. The bad guys go and they buy those and they just see what they can get. It's a little bit of fun. It's kind of, um, it's kind of like treasure hunting. So be really careful about your tech junk. And you all know, I'm sure the old found it in the parking lot thumb drive trick, right? The flash drive thumb drives. Um, never, ever, ever, ever plug in an old thumb drive that you don't know where it came from um, that was found, even to see who it belongs to. Um, that, that just consider that a time bomb. So um, th that is also, it's kind of an oldie, but a goodie. Um, and it's uh, still works for a lot of folks to introduce bad information, uh, bad, bad actors into your computer. So curb your curiosity and uh, throw it away. Okay, um, and then in the advent of how many of you have ring cameras or um, blink cameras and um, other internet of things, um, Nest thermostats and Alexa, and I probably just set off somebody's Alexa by saying that, um, apologies. So, so it, it is important to go check the settings on those devices as well. Um, to make sure that you are not accidentally broadcasting or allowing people to drop in uninvited into a listening or a 
viewing mode. I personally love um, little stickers or tape over cameras. Uh, I think that there's no harm in that um, it, to be a little bit paranoid. Um, I think that you know it, there are lots of um, reasons just from a safety and security perspective to not include um, devices like um, uh, uh, some of the echo shows and some of the other devices that are very helpful for displaying the weather or music in your bedroom but um, also with a built-in camera I would never leave it without a, a sticker that I I have to opt in to allow someone to see in um, so these are these are tricks that particularly as we see um, families wanting to stay connected and the drop-in function in our own household has been brilliant for my children to stay connected to their grandparents um, but you know it, it's as much for my dad's protection as it is for the kids that they not have um, just accidental viewing privileges and that that be something where someone has to physically opt in by removing a sticker from in front of the camera. So keep an eye on on those devices. Those are low tech and cheap ways to um, cover the mic or cover the uh, the camera in uh, in your devices. Another little safety trick is if you are setting up a Wi-Fi router in your house, um, one good practice is to have your, your computer network that runs your laptop, your desktop, things with data. Um, let that be one Wi-Fi network with a separate name and a separate password and put your TV or your, um, your, your thermostat on another Wi-Fi network with a separate name and a separate password. And therefore, no one can kind of co-mingle. And if, if Ring Network has a, a unfixed um, bug one day, uh, there's no way for people to cross over from the camera and TV and thermostat network into your um, your laptop and data network. So just a couple little tricks of setting up um, uh, to, to protect yourself. A little extra work goes a long way for, um, for uh, protecting your information. Um, you know, I, I will tell you this, I, I usually give this slide as a business saying, don't let strangers in your building, but I'm going to actually flip this around and say, don't let strangers in anybody else's building. As, a, as you are um, going into um, uh, businesses or, um, or in, into providers that you, you patronize, be aware that, um, that there are probably new visitor protocols in place. Um, a lot of folks have kind of locked down their, their business during the pandemic and they're not letting um, normal client flow through the building. Um, and so just, just help them with that. Be aware um, and that you don't accidentally introduce a security risk into a, your favorite CPA or your favorite doctor, et cetera. Um, I, this is, yes, ma'am. Can you just clarify, uh, Connie had a question she, um, about the two Wi-Fi systems, like where you were saying, um, just to kind of clarify how, you know, Clarify that again. Yeah, of course. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. No, so it could be as simple as going to Best Buy and buying two separate Wi-Fi routers and just naming them to two different things. Call one the TVs and other junk. Call the other one super secret business stuff. Um, and you, when you plug those into your internet connection, and and you can have one internet connection supplying two Wi-Fi networks in your house. Um, it it I mean those are that's a going from you know sixty dollars to one hundred and twenty dollars. You have instant security. Put your put all your thermostats when your thermostat says what Wi-Fi network to join. Don't put it on the super secret data one. Put it on the TVs and other junk. When Ring says what Wi-Fi network am I joining to be able to record all of your front door doorbell rings put it on the TV one. And that way you've segregated, you've kept it so that nobody could ever use your ring doorbell to get into your quick, your quicken file with all of your financials. So you could still have one router, but just separate net uh, Wi-Fi, separate, separate Wi-Fi boxes. Correct. And that would still be okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You, one, one internet utility cable coming out of the wall um, and you can create um, a, a way to, um, to make, to split that off into two separate Wi-Fi boxes. So. 
I think that um, makes people think like, oh, it's, you know, you're paying for more than one connection, but you're still, you're still just paying Cox or whoever you have one bill. You're just separating it within your own internal network. And I'm only talking at that point about the wireless network. I'm not talking about two separate wires coming out of the the Cox utility or the Comcast utility, uh, wherever that box is. I'm talking about your wireless network. And so you can share, you can, you can definitely have as many wireless networks and, and several of the devices that you buy from Best Buy, if you don't buy the cheap $60 one and you buy the upgraded, you know, uh, ones, some of them come with the ability to have just one box and two Wi-Fi networks, a guest network and a, um, a sort of homeowner network. So yeah, you can, th- you, you can talk to the Best Buy guys. They will point you in the right direction. Just tell them what you want to do. I want to have two separate Wi-Fi networks so that I can keep my toys and my business separate. Um, I think all of us have have heard multiple times. I always go back to some of the oldies but goodies, though, and I just will tell you in this day and age, don't give credit card numbers over the phone if you don't have to. And of course, never, ever email a credit card number ever, anywhere, ever, not your social security number, not your um, uh, vital information and never, ever, ever a credit card number. Everything over the internet is subject to be intercepted. So, but also don't forget if you're standing at Target and you're giving your credit card number to your doctor's office, uh, you know, little um, little corn stalks have big ears, little potatoes have big eyes. So um, keep that in mind. Okay, um, and. If you've been asked to give your card um, number over the phone, be sure to get a receipt. Um, that there are sometimes there are vendors who don't who who are just writing that down and um, and putting it on a sticky note. And so it's it's always best wherever possible to give a credit card um, in physical um, proximity. Um, or if you have to give it over the phone, as I said, give it over a regular landline, which is plugged into the wall and not um, a cell phone. But um, more and more electronic payments are the way to go and allowing your bank to accept the risk for that. So doing bill pay puts the risk of sending money to bad guys on the bank, um, uh, more of that risk on the bank, um, if, if that gets misdirected or intercepted. So, so I highly encourage you to, to use more um, uh, electronic means of uh, commerce like Venmo, Apple Pay, et cetera. Um, of course they pay me to say that though. So um, I just can't encourage you to be paranoid enough. Uh, <laughs> I, I know I've said that over and over again, even, people you um, that, that sound legitimate are they're very good con people so please 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 be careful um, and and slow down the conversation um, when you think uh, that somebody is pulling your leg I have for you some resources because I promised you and I want to get to um, to who can you trust uh, let's see here actually so a couple of places are um, uh, places I send people not only when when they want to find out kind of what's known about them but also when they want to report something or they want to find out what what does good look like um, so really and truly a lot of this data protection fr- uh, fraud and risk management is managed by the Federal Trade Commission um, Department of Homeland Security is involved in a lot of it um, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology um, and then we have a fairly decent um, uh, White House website in CIO.gov um, uh, that has some good information. So if you get stuck and you need help and you want to do some research on your own, check those out. There are also great, um, uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, you can plug in your email address at haveibeenpawned.com. That's not a typo. It's um, it's slang that the kids use. Um, pond is, is uh kind of owned, and I think you know what owned is. Um, so have I been pond.com. It's a legitimate uh, research tool to see if your email address has been part of a, a known data breach. Um, and then, uh, you know, the BBB here locally is fantastic uh, for helping to publish and, and get out to the media any 
particularly local scams. Um, and every once in a while, you will hear a utility company or a public um, safety organization say that they're they're part of some phone scam, um, and don't don't answer it, don't don't fall for it. The BBB is generally the person, uh, the people who help educate about that. So check check with them. But there are some other ones. Snopes.com can tell you whether somebody is um, whether a um, a rumor is true or not, or a phishing attempt is true. Same with fraud. You can always go look up who who a website really is at whois.org. If you if you don't recognize the URL, the address of that website, go plug it in there and check it out and see who's paying for this. Who who is the um, it, if it's legitimate? If it really is Wells Fargo, uh, Wells Fargo will be on the receipt as paying for that website. And just, and, to, clarify, just to clarify on that website, um, have I been pawned? It's P-W-N-E-D or is it P-A? No, it's P-W-N-E-D. Yes. Thank you okay. for clarifying. Yes. I'm, listen, I didn't make the website. I know it's weird. It's even, it, it, it's, um, some people even say pwned instead of pond. Yeah. I say pond, but, um, but yes, that is the correct spelling. And um, it, it is, it was set up by people who were kind of insiders in the hacker industry. So I think that's why they chose that. Okay. Um, Just wanted to make yeah. sure. So uh, last, last but not least, I know we're running short on time, but um, as I mentioned before, please report, please, please, please don't think that something happened to you and that you were at fault and it's embarrassing and humiliating, get on Google's website, go report abuse to them. Um, they can shut down fake email addresses only after people have reported abuse and you could potentially be saving other people from falling victim. So it's it's a civic duty in my opinion to report scammers and scamsters. Um, and then if you want tips to help kind of educate your friends and family, if you just wanna be fun at a cocktail party, um, go check out some of these stay safe online uh, uh, websites. There are, um, there are lots of tools and tips and tricks out there. So um, with that, I will happily answer it and stay, I'll stay as long as you'd like to talk about this and questions. I hope this was useful. I, I warned you, it would be a little uncomfortable, um, but I think that um, hopefully there was some information that was useful and helpful in there. I think it definitely was. Uh, I apologize, the landscapers are out front of my house, so in case you're hearing noises now. Um, but I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll end the official recording and then uh, we'll ask a few questions after that. But we do wanna thank you so much, Christy, for being with us here today and taking your time and simplifying this and just really giving us some really practical suggestions that we can do to make ourselves safer. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure, I'll be back anytime. And uh, my phone number was there, so give me a call, send me an email. I am happy to help educate, it's my life's calling. Thank you. And just to let you all know, next week we have another guest, another local guest. We actually are going to be having um, Shannon Riggs and Libby Toby, who um, own Pop Cycle, which I don't know if you guys don't know about Pop Cycle, you need to know about Pop Cycle. So um, they are a woman owned business, but they are also all about, uh, they're totally local centric, getting local artists, but they're also all about sustainability. So we're gonna be talking about that, but we're also, they're gonna have some really awesome gift ideas. Like maybe you have somebody that's really hard to buy for, you're going to find the gift form. So we'll have them with us next week. So we thank you all for joining us and we will see you again next week.